Good morning. So I've been, uh, I probably watch too much TV, pay too much attention to social media, take in too much, too much information. Uh, I was listening to a guy yesterday and they were talking about how you need, there's this whole idea of mindfulness in our culture right now about being more mindful about what's going on around you. And one of the persons that was in the interview said that, that uh, he, he just had to turn off all of his stuff. And when he turned off all of his stuff, he heard noises that he had forgotten or didn't even realize were a part of his life. And I have to be honest with y'all, I've got a pair of those noise cancellation headphones, and I wear those to cut out some of those noises that I hear in my house, I hear, I hear around me, and I probably shouldn't, because there are times that I'll be sitting out on the porch, and I'll have those on, and I'll take them off, and I'll hear the geese, and I'll hear the ducks, and I'll hear all the other things but I'll also hear the kids screaming across the lake and the pond and everything. So you got all those things going on around us. And one of the things that I've been hearing a lot lately is, man, I can't, get wet. I can't wait to get back to what it used to be. I can't wait to get back to the normal. And everyone is putting so much faith and trust in the vaccine, which... Uh, I mean, regardless of, of where you stand on the vaccine, and I, I just, I need to say something really quickly about that. Um, everyone's got an opinion about it. You don't have to tell everyone. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to tell everyone your opinion. You can keep those things to yourself. I don't know if you know that or not, but I'm giving you permission to keep those things to yourself right now. Because I can assure you that there is someone on the opposing, uh, on the opposing part of the spectrum of your opinion, and more than likely, they don't want to hear your opinion. It's okay for you to have your opinion, but it's not necessary for you to tell everyone what your opinion is. But we're at this place of going, man, I can't wait to get back to the norm, to the way it used to be. And my question to y'all is, do we really need to get back to the way it used to be? Maybe. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe. God has got us where he wants us. Maybe God is going to use this or is trying to use this. Everything that's been transpiring, the coronavirus, for Louisianians and everyone on the South Coast, all the hurricanes, for everything, maybe God is trying to get us where he wants us. Maybe he's trying to get us to a place of humility. To a place of recognizing that we don't have as much control over our lives as we think we do. That the things in our lives don't hold as much sway in our lives as we think they do. That the things that we have propped up our lives with do not hold as much power and as much influence in our lives as they should or as we think they do. Maybe. Just maybe God's trying to get us to a place where he wants us. I've told y'all before, I'm not real big on sermon titles. I was joking with my son on Friday, and um, he said, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on this. And I said, I, I think the, the, the kind of the summary, the, the one point is this, and I guess this is my title. And I said, you know how I feel about titles. And he just laughed hysterically. He said, Dad, you've never, you never liked titles. But as we read through this passage of Scripture, the one, thing, the one thing that grabs me is this. This idea of a posture of praise. A posture of praise. And it may very well be that God is trying to get us to this place, to get us in a posture of of praising him, honoring him, acknowledging him, glorifying him, instead of all the things that we give glory and honor and praise to in our lives. So I want us to look at this passage. It's, it's probably a familiar passage to a lot of us. If you've been raised around the church, in the church, you've probably heard this. It's found in Luke 1, beginning in verse 46. It's what the Word of God says. And Mary said, 
My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on his humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and, is holy, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from the thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So the context of this story, if you're not familiar with it, is Mary has gone to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth is with child, with John the Baptist. Mary is with child, with Jesus. And Mary goes and visits Elizabeth. And the scripture right above this says that when Mary enters in, that John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth leaps. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember whenever our kids got bigger in the womb, and I would want to fill them. And Marcy's like, no, I fill them all the time. You don't want to fill that. And there would be times that Marcy would be sitting there and she'd be going, oh my gosh, quit stretching out. Because it's like the foot is just, it's, it's this, I, I guess, I guess that's what's going on. But I wanted to fill the baby. Marcy wasn't too excited about it. So I would get up close and I'd kind of tap on the stomach trying to get the baby to do something. I wanted to feel the movement of the child. I can't imagine what it felt like for John the Baptist to leap in the womb of Elizabeth. And that word leap is to leap. I mean, to joy, extravagant joy. Can you imagine? There's this stuff going on all inside of Elizabeth. And she's like, Mary, could you go outside? But at that time, Elizabeth knew precisely what was going on in the life of Mary. You see, they didn't have social media. They didn't have the means by which to communicate all this. And then Elizabeth speaks this blessing over Mary. And it's at that point that Mary realizes to the greater degree than probably she had up to that point that something amazing was going on in her life. But we, we can't lose sight of the fact of who Mary was. I think Mary was either 14 to 16 years old. She was unwed. She was under, she was under the sentence of death because she was pregnant outside of wedlock. I'm sure she was tired. I can't imagine being 14 to 16. I can't imagine being pregnant. But I can't imagine being 14 to 16 year old and pregnant. Could you imagine what it would be like to walk into your parents? Hey, just want you to know I'm pregnant. Now, as a dad, I would have said, who's the father? And she would have said, the Holy Spirit? Yeah, right. Who have you slept with? Can you imagine the tension? Can you imagine the stress of that conversation? Can you imagine everything that's going on in the life of this child, this 14-year-old child? And that's where she is. And as I'm reading this, my question to you is, what's going on in your life right now that feels overwhelming? What's going on in your life right now that feels like it's just a weight that you're at the point where you almost cannot bear it? Because that's where Mary is. I've sat with people these past two weeks who are going through that very thing. And they're looking at me saying, Scott, I don't know if I can deal with this anymore. I don't know if I can bear this weight anymore. And Mary's at this place. And what does she do? What does she do? She praises God. Think about that. 
When you're at a place where you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling this amount of stress in your life, what is your first inclination? What is the first thing that you think about? I'll tell you where a lot of people go. And, and, and a lot of people go to the place of, 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 of turning inward and feeling it's all about them. It's all about me. It's all about my life. It's all about what's going on in me. But Mary doesn't do that. She turns outward. Listen to what it says again. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, magnifies, makes God bigger, praises God for his greatness, turns my attention and my focus and my affection to God and just declares who he is. And that word magnified means habitual. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a moment in time. It is this habitual magnification of God. She is committing at this point and she doesn't even realize what's going to come. She doesn't realize that she's going to be looking at her son up on the cross, brutally crucified, brutally beaten and have to observe that. She doesn't even know that's going to happen. But in this moment, with all the stress and all the shame and all the, 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 the feeling of emotion that she's having to deal with, her first response is to magnify the Lord. That's a posture of praise. It's a posture and a position that I don't know about you, but there are times that that's not where I go. I get ticked at the other person. I get frustrated with the situation. I try to deal with the shame. And when I deal with the shame, I go and hide. Instead of magnifying the Lord. She said, my soul, my very being, the depth of the core of my being magnifies and praises my God. She is essentially saying this. I want you to hear this. God, thank you for putting me in this position. Is that where you go? When you're in that place of frustration, do you go, God, thank you for putting me in this position. As we've been going through this, this pandemic, have you gone, God, thank you. Thank you for putting me in this position. Or have you griped and moaned? Have you shared your opinion with people who didn't want to hear your opinion? Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And then she goes on and says it. She repeats it again. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You see, everything is turned outward. She's not focusing on what she's going through. It's not that she hasn't thought about it. It's not that it hasn't been a consideration. It's not that she hasn't cried herself to sleep. I'm not saying that none of those things happen. I'm saying in this moment, in this time, she is magnifying and glorifying God. She said, listen, God, I realize that you have put me in this place. Elizabeth confirmed it. I realize that we are in this place together. And so I will praise you and I will magnify you and I will glorify you. Habitually. I will rejoice. That rejoice is an extravagant rejoicing. It's a jumping. It's a leaping. That's what that word means. So not only in the moments that you're feeling weight of what's going on in your life, but just in the everyday, your everyday life, do you find yourself leaping for joy of who God is? Do you find yourself extravagantly praising God for who God is? Y'all, I've said this before, but we extravagantly praise and magnify and glorify so many other things in our lives. And yet Mary is magnifying and glorifying God in the midst of the most difficult, uh, at that time, the most difficult time of her life. You see what she says? She says, I rejoice in God, my Savior my deliverer, my rescuer. You see, she knew that she needed a savior. She knew it. The posture of praise is humility. The posture of praise is humility. The reason a lot of us don't praise to this degree, a lot of us don't jump joyfully, the reason a lot of us don't experience the rejoicing that Mary is expressing right now is because we are prideful. We think we can do it ourselves. We think everything about our lives is about us. And we're prideful. 
And maybe God is getting us trying to utilize what's going on in the world today. Maybe God is trying to do that to say, listen, you're prideful. You're trusting far too much in yourself. You're trusting far too much in your accomplishments and what you've done and what you think you've done. You're trusting far too much. And we have people around us. We have people probably sitting in this room right now, people online, people that are, that are connected to us who trusted in their things, trusted in their materialism, trusted in what they had. And right now, they don't have that anymore. And where are they leaning? Where are they trusting? Posture praise begins with humility. Where are you? Where are you in this position and place of pride and humility? Because God is calling you to magnify him. God is calling you to praise him and to honor him for who he is. She goes on and says this, For he has looked on my humble estate of his servant. She knows her posture. She knows her position. She knows she's from a lowly state. Throughout Scripture, what that means is someone in poverty. It means a peasant girl. It means a girl who doesn't have much. And I don't know if you've ever asked the question as you read through the Christmas story. I don't know if you've ever asked the question, God, why did you choose Mary? Of all the women... Of all the women that were around, why didn't you choose someone of royalty that had some kind of exposure, some kind of influence? Why didn't you choose her? But instead, you picked out this 14 to 16-year-old peasant girl to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Is it possibly because God knew the state of her heart. See, God had purpose in her life. God has purpose in your life. God has purpose in my life. But my question is, is God able to use us? Are we available to him? Or are we so prideful and so caught up in ourselves that we miss what God wants to do through us? And Mary is so open to it. She's like, I'm your servant. I'm your bond servant. A bond servant was one who chose to serve. Do you see yourself as a servant of the king? Do you see yourself as a servant of God? Or do you see yourself as one who goes along and just kind of settles into this relationship with God? Because our posture should be a posture of humility. And Mary gets it. He looked on my humble estate and I am his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And I just want to make this really clear. Surely you see this. When she says, everybody's going to call me blessed, she wasn't looking at herself with arrogance going, man, I am it now. Do you know why she knows that people are going to call her blessed? It's because of what God has done through her. It has everything to do with God. Are you able to walk around, maybe not vocalize it, but are you able to walk around and say, God calls me blessed? It's very prevalent within the Southern culture. How are you blessed? I just want to ask the people, why are you blessed? Why are you blessed? And a lot of times when people say, I'm blessed, They'll say, I got my stuff and I got my house and I got my, I got all. No, 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 no. The reason we're blessed is because God has chosen to work through us, in us, and he's chosen to give us a savior. We're not blessed because of what we have. We're blessed because of whose we are. She knew that she would be blessed. Now, something I really want to clarify really quickly is that Mary is just like you and I. Mary is not sinless. She's not without sin. She's just like you and I. She's only unique in the fact that she understands who God is and who she is before God. Then Mary goes on. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Do you see what she says? 
God has done great things for me, but I want to point this out. He didn't rip her out of poverty. He didn't rip her out of being a peasant. He didn't fix everything in her life. And we live in a world, even in the church, that says you come and you start following Jesus and everything gets fixed. That's not the way it works. He didn't go into her life and fix everything and put everything in place and then say, you will be the mom of the Savior of the world. No, he went to her where she was, in her position and in her state. He didn't rescue her out of her material place. He said, listen, I've come to be your Savior of your soul. And if you're in a place right now where your position or your status or where you are in life is not where you want to be, I just want to tell you by following Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean that he will raise you out of that. But it does mean that he will rescue you from your sin and the death that comes with your sin. We got to get out of this idea that God's the fix-it man that I got this thing in my life that needs to be rescued, and so he's going to come in and he's going to fix it. Do you realize that he allows us to be in places and situations and circumstances that we hate? Do you realize that? If you're a parent, you understand that. Because sometimes your kids are are like, I'm going to go do this. And you're like, okay, go do it. You don't have a clue what the consequences are. You don't have a clue what's going to happen to you. But go ahead. And God will allow that so that he can form us, he can mold us, he can shape us, he can sharpen us. But Mary turns all attention and affection back to God. She says, you are holy. He's done great things for me. He doesn't say he's done great things for us. He says, he's done great things for me. Are you able to make that witness and that testimony and that declaration that God has done great things for me? And you may be in a difficult situation struggling right now, but I just want to tell you that you can look in your life and you can find places where God has done great things for you. Even if you're not, listen, even if you're not following him right now, he's still hard after you. He will come after you because of his love and his passion for you. And then what she does is she unpacks throughout the rest of this this song, she unpacks who God is. And I just want to read kind of quickly who God, she says God is. She says, he is mighty, he is holy, he is merciful, he is strong, he fights for you. He is your provider, he is your helper, and he is your promise keeper. At the very end, he says, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever, God is the one who will be faithful, who will be mighty, who will be strong, who will fight for you regardless of your circumstances. He is for you. He will be with you because that's who God is. And Mary, this 14 to 16 year old child knows this. Do you? Do you know this? I think the reason a lot of people don't know it is this one little phrase that she puts in this passage. It's a phrase that's been discontinued in the church. And she says this. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. You're not, no, that's no, you're not supposed to fear God. You're not supposed to, he's, he's, He's a warm, squishy, fuzzy. I mean, he's, 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 he's God's love. When I, think, when I think of this image of God, I, I can't remember the name of the show, but it's that big old white, big old squishy white caricature. And they walk up and they hug this big old, I can't, well, I, man, I should know the name of it. But it's like, ooh, you know, it's this thing. It's, oh God, you're so wonderful. You're so The mercy is there for those who fear him. Do you fear the Lord? 
And I tell you, I've heard preachers, and I've probably done it as well, so forgive me if I have, but I've heard preachers who say, well, that's not really be fearful. That's, that's reverence and awe. It is reverence and awe. But it's being scared out of your wits, too. I've told you the story. My dad was five foot five, five foot six. He wasn't much bigger than that. But my dad carried a presence, and I was scared of my father. I was scared of my dad, but I knew that my dad loved me. And it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. It's not either love or fear. It is love in fear. It is this understanding that your dad loves you and that you should be fearful of him. Do you fear the Lord? Do you recognize that God is able to do whatever, whenever, however he wants to do it? He could smite you immediately. He could smite me right now. He could do whatever he wants to do because that's who God is. I'm his creation. I'm his servant. He can do whatever he wants to. And yet what he chooses to do is to love me. Do you fear him? Because it's in that fear that you understand who God is. It's in that fear that you put God in the proper position, which brings you to a place of humility, which brings you to a place of praise. You see, the reason a lot of us can't get to the place that Mary has gotten is because we don't fear the Lord anymore. I told my son on Friday, I said, you know, I was, I was watching on TikTok and he just went, what, dad, what are you doing? I'm like, that's where the kids are. It's not just where the kids are. It's where our world is. And there's some bad stuff on there. But one thing that keeps coming across my thread are these people that are presenting a Jesus that I don't know. The people that are presenting a God that I've never heard of or never seen, but they're presenting this, this warm, fuzzy God that I can do whatever I want to do and I can, I can make choices that I want to make that in no way represent the commandments of God, in no way represent the holiness of God, of which Mary talks about, and yet they're presenting this. Why? Because they're able to do whatever they want to do and they're able to be a Christian. And I just want to tell you, and I want to tell you, no. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. That wasn't original with Jesus. That happened back in the Old Testament it's too, too, when God said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Do you fear the Lord? If you don't have a fear of the Lord, if you don't have, if you don't have a right understanding of who God is, you will not worship. You will not praise. You will not submit. And you will not humble yourself. And the secret in that equation is you are your own God. What's your posture? Is your posture of praise, of magnifying God, of lifting him up, of declaring who he is, of making him known, mighty, holy, strong, provider, promise keeper, knowing that and just worshiping him and magnifying him? Or is it whenever I need you, God, I'll call you in. But until then, if you could just move to the side for me, I would really appreciate that. As we're in this time of Advent, moving toward Christmas, are you worshiping our God? Are you magnifying our God? Are you rejoicing, leaping joyfully in God, your Savior? I heard a guy on the radio last week, and he said, okay, I just got to get this off my chest. He said, those of you who can't say Merry Christmas... Don't celebrate it. You don't have the right to celebrate it. If you can't say Merry Christmas, you don't have the right to celebrate it. I don't know where you stand on that. Some of you are in agreement because you're shaking your heads. But I want to say this. To those of you that are sitting here, to those of you who are watching, to those of you who profess that you are a follower of Jesus, if you move into Christmas 
and don't find yourself celebrating and magnifying and praising and glorifying God, you've missed it. You've missed it. Because we celebrate it every week. Jesus, the one that was in the womb of Mary, came and gave his life for you and I so that we could have life. Because without him, we have death. That's it. Period. End of story. Separated from everything that God wants to do in and through us. What's your posture? 